appreciate all the men who serve us so beautifully, who give up their Thursday to be here. I do like to complicate this moment by putting all the things on the table. Did you love that song? A song about Eden, about God's original design for humanity. It's beautiful, and I believe it's what he has for us this year. But before I start my message, there's many of you online, hello, and in this room who perhaps don't know me. My name is Tess. You're new to sisterhood. And I thought the best thing to do to create a human connection between us is to bring you in on some of my journey and some of my story so that when I share with you what I believe God has placed on my heart for sisterhood, the vision and mission of where we're going and who we are and what we're about and what I believe God is wanting us to be in this season, you will hear it from this heart. Just an ordinary girl who's believing that extraordinary things can happen on the earth. Amen? Amen. So I want to tell you that every year... I begin in a certain way. I ask God what he sees for my year. Because how many of you know that many of are the plans of a man's heart? But it's the purposes of God that prevail. Amen? And so I ask him, God, what do you see for my year? Should I do it all again? And this year, I didn't do that. And I'm going to take you through a little journey of my journal so you can understand from where I'm coming from this year. On the 30th of January, which FYI, for those of you who are not part of Link Church, but welcome, we love you, we're grateful to have you here. On the 30th of January, it was a Monday, directly after Vision Sunday, I didn't ask God what he wanted me for me in the year. I told God that I was going to quit, that I was no longer going to continue in church work, that it was, the cost was too great, I was very tired, and quite frankly, and no disrespect to anybody who likes to do this, I I wanted to stay home and bake. (laughs) And I, I just, I wanted to master something else. On the 31st of January, as I went for my morning run, I was on the home stretch, because you know in January we all like to become better, so what do we do? (laughs) We run. And I was on the home stretch, and just before I got home, I felt this deep sense and impression within my spirit, who told you you can quit? Now, I've never heard the audible voice of God. I haven't. But this was so distinct and almost so deafening as I was running. I actually stopped in the middle of the pathway and was like, who was that? (laughs) Who told you you can quit? Because if I called you, surely I will sustain you. And if I am the start, then surely I will be the finish. And because I'm honest and open with God and I have a beautiful relationship with my Father in heaven, my response to this moment was, I told myself I can quit. I decide for my life this year, 2023. Thank you very much. And I carried on running. I want to fast forward just three days later. We were standing in a conference in Joburg. We decided to go to the Passion Equip Conference for leaders and pastors around South Africa. Beautiful opportunity to stand in a room of a thousand plus people. Louis Giglio was there. I was expectant for beautiful worship, by passion worship. And I was standing there and I was feeling ministered to. And, you know, I'd already decided I was going to quit, but I was just here to be, you know, loved upon. And Louis Giglio, who had flown all the way out from the USA, who has no idea who I am and has absolutely no clue what I'm going through, gets up and says, the title of my message is, do not quit. (laughs) Amen? I want to say to you this evening that God will do anything and he will use anyone. He will fly a man all the way from the United States to South Africa to make sure that some random girl that he knows intimately will continue to walk out the purposes and plans that he has for her life because he's that good. Amen? 
And those who were there, I know some of you who were in the room, you would have watched and you can testify to the deep work God did in me that morning as the Holy Spirit urged me and invited me once more to respond to the call on my life to build his church, to preach the gospel, to shepherd people and to worship him with everything that I have inside of me, even when it feels like it's not enough. And so in the past few weeks, it's from this place of fresh conviction and then this place of humility and surrender unto God who has graciously said, come again, daughter, that I've asked with much respect. (laughs) What do you see for my year this year, Father? What are you calling me to? What are you asking of me? Am I doing this again, God? Am I building sisterhood again? Are we just going to keep gathering women again? Are we going to rally, rally again? Are we going to conference again? Are we going to place value on women again? And you know what I felt him say? Yes. (laughs) Yes, you're going to build again. You're going to build again. You're going to build again. Brick by brick, you're going to build again. You're going to build again. And so, sisterhood, if you're sitting here for the first time, I want you to know that this is not just an event that you've decided to show up at online. This is not just an event that you've clicked on. The God of the universe who knows you intimately, every hair on your head, who knows your name, has ushered you unto himself to meet with you, to set in motion value and divine purpose for your life. This is not just an event. Sisterhood is who we are. We're building each other. We're not building events four times a year. We're building each other. We're building a movement that serves the church and serves the community and humanity at large. And this is what I have to say before I go any further. I refuse to do this alone. I refuse to do this alone. We are so much better together. We are stronger and more effective together. And I believe that scripture is true and says if one can put a thousand to flight, then two can put 10,000 to flight. I don't know how many people are sitting in this room, but you do the math. That's a lot of thousands of darkness that we can put to flight in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we are here for a great purpose, and I want to ask the question, how are we going to build again? So I've asked God this, and I believe he's given me a word tonight that will help us see how we're going to build sisterhood again, because it's been three years of some very, very inconsistent, kind of crazy rhythms, and I believe God has come and said, I want you to find your metronome again, church. I want you to find yourselves again, sisterhood, because you have a job to do. There is a world that is crying out for the love of a father, and we are the ones that carry the spirit to show that very thing. And so how are we going to build again? Well, I believe we need to go back to the start to understand exactly what we're building. And at the very start, at the very heart of sisterhood, is this mission, this conviction that we are called to place value on, the, on women. To place value on women, it's simple. To place value on women in the church and in every sphere of influence that we may find ourselves in. No matter where you find yourself in, day in and day out, our call and mandate is sisterhood. It's to place value on women. And we do this primarily through gathering. And when we gather, we are equipped by the word of God and we're mobilized to go and reach the full potential of what Jesus Christ himself has placed inside of us so that the world would see him. Amen? And so we gather, we're equipped, and we're mobilized. And this is the whisper, essentially, that I felt in 2014. It's like nine years ago of sisterhood. Can we just say amen and hallelujah to that? We did nine years of this. It's awesome. And it, it, essentially, it is something that I heard Bobby Houston say. This was not some grand test idea. I heard a whisper from her mouth, a picture of what could be if women would gather, and then if they were equipped and mobilized, and if they would know 
Like, what would be if women knew their inherent value? And so if we're going to build again, that looks like all of us, all of us, placing value on women. But in order to do that, we have to, and I don't like to say we have to often, but this is the one instance where it must be said, we have to have a revelation that's a deep, supernatural understanding of what our value is. We cannot place value on anyone else if we do not first understand the value God himself has placed on us. And if you're unsure of your value tonight, if it's unclear for you, if it's in question, I want to reveal, perhaps for the first time, or remind you the value that the Father has placed on you. Amen? Amen. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, I'd love you to turn with me to Genesis 1, verse 26. We need to go back to the beginning. Sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of the story. Nothing makes sense. I want to encourage you when you're in that space, go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. Let's read together. Genesis 1 verse 26. Then God said, he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, ha let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want to settle this up front. Can we settle this up front? Women, raise your hand, women. We are created in the image of God. Not in the image of man, in the image of God. And we have been given a divine purpose alongside man to have dominion, to create, and then to have dominion. That means to rule and reign, to lead and have influence on the earth here together. This is not the man's thing to do. This was their thing to do together, and it's our thing to do together. Amen? So right up front, we can settle it. Our value is absolutely equal. And this is the story of the beginning. It's better than you think it is. And the truth of who he is and who we are is found in Eden. It's found in Genesis 1 and 2. And I believe God is inviting us as the women of the church to rise in this next season to build again by carrying the truth and then to minister it, to share it, to serve it to a world that is confused and driven by media and culture. Could we perhaps be the ones who would partner with God in restoring Eden here on earth? What does that mean? Restoring the true design and purpose of God to earth today. Union with God and unity with each other. And for those of you who are wondering about Genesis and it's confusing, I just want to help you. The creation story found within this book is actually a poem. And it was inspired by God himself. It was given to his Israelite people so they could make sense of their beginning, how it all started, and make sense of their very existence. Because the nations surrounding them had these very violent battle stories about how they came into existence. And God gave them the story that would showcase the love of a father who would create Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the very beginning with his own hands and his own breath very different to what they were hearing around them so that people would know that it was a father who started it all. In Eden, we see a blueprint for humanity. We see a blueprint for humanity. And I know that over time, that has become blurry. And that's why we need to go back to the beginning. We need to understand that, yes, we have a part to play in the story, but the story it's not essentially about us. The story starts with God. If you read Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God. 
Eden is the beginning of the story and it's full of his presence. A story that Jesus is intricately a part of. If you read in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was at the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. This is the story of the beginning. This is the story that we are a part of. But it starts with him. It doesn't start with us. It doesn't end with us. And that is good news. Because this is where we find our value. We don't find it from our own effort or understanding. We find it from the start of the story that's all about him. And honestly, I believe if we as a people and I'm talking all people, male, female, wherever you might find yourself, if we had a true, deep knowing, revelation, spiritual understanding of Genesis 1, 2, 3, we would be completely at ease with ourselves and with each other. And we would not be striving or using our own human effort to try and place value on women. It would come effortlessly and with ease. But the problem is, is that if you read on in the story, Genesis 3 happens and we sang about it. There's the serpent and he lies and everything falls apart. I don't have time to hear here. Actually, when I was preparing this, I thought I really should do an equip class. It'd be so much fun. You could all come and we'd just study Genesis 1 to 3 together. We should totally do that. Anyway, I'm not going to go there now. But what happens is everything falls apart. And it's caused us as women over time to consistently believe a lie that we are less than that we're subordinate to. And what's arisen is this unhealthy spectrum of responses to the responses that show up largely as our inability for us to find our true value in God. And you know what? I don't blame man. You might. I don't. It's the devil's fault. We are spending, I believe, way too much time blaming the wrong person fighting the wrong person. We were designed, if you read the story in the very beginning, we were designed to live like this. And all throughout history, what do you see of man and woman? This. This. This was the design of God. And you know, I spent years Genuinely, I spent years at war within myself, fighting for my place alongside the men in the world. Like, would they see my value? Would they know what I held and what I could bring to the table? And one day, God met me in my disillusionment around women and society. And, and I found him say, Tess, focus your fight. You're fighting the wrong people. <laughs> You're fighting in the wrong place. This is not a fight against flesh and blood. Do you know that? Every day when you wake up in the morning and there's a wrestle in your spirit for something that's going on, it's not a flesh and blood wrestle. It's a wrestle against a fight against the principalities of darkness, the forces of the evil one, the devil who's the one who lied from the very beginning. He's the one that lied, not the guys the devil. And what does he say to them in the garden? Did God really say that? Did God really say? Did God really say you can create and have dominion alongside man? Did God really say that you're the apple of his eye? Did God really say that he has plans and purposes for your future that are for good? Did God really say that? And the same devil that lied to them in the garden is the same devil that's been lying to us for all of eternity and is lying to us right now. And he's causing us to question our value, our contribution, and our purpose. And I think it's time that we stand up and say, no more. I'm not going to sit around for the next 50 years of my life, God willing. And I'll allow you to continue to lie about who I am and about my husband and about my children and about the women that I get to do life with and lead and about the church that I'm a part of, the church that God himself is building on the earth. No, 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 no. You don't get to lie anymore because I know who I am. I am valuable. 
I was created for a purpose to build something in this generation. And so I do not need a title given to me by man. I do not need a signed stamp of approval. I do not need to be anything else other than who God has created me to be and respond obediently to the call that God has given me and placed on my life. Amen. Amen. I'm the same stance that I stand with today. The same inner conviction that I carry for myself. Let me tell you, I carry it for you. I carry it for you. And I believe, girls, it's time that we go to war for one another. That can sound very extreme. I know war is a very masculine, orientated word. But I honestly believe that God has placed a tenacious fire within us to go to war for one another. Amen? And how do we do that? How do we do that? One of the ways we do that is we place value on one another. Another way that we do that is by embracing our God design. Do you know that in Genesis, we're called the Ezer Kenegdo. And I want to read it to you. Turn to Genesis 2. It's a beautiful part of the story. The Bible is so beautiful. And we are so privileged in this nation to have free access to it in every single version you could possibly imagine. I want to encourage you to go on a journey with Scripture. It will change your life even when you don't feel it or believe it because it's that good and that powerful. Amen? Genesis 2 verse 19, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. And so Adam gave all the names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Comparable. There was no helper comparable, a helper that could be his equal. That's what comparable means. So God looked all over the earth. He's like, there's no one that can be equal to this. There's no one comparable to him. And so what did he do? He created Eve. And you know, this English word helper, it's, it trips us up a little bit because it has this implied meaning of being less than, being secondary, like, shame, you're just the helper. <laughs> like, we don't mean it to be like that, but... Let's be honest. It hasn't got a very positive, like, yeah, I'm the helper today. Other than when you're Joel, with Gary, and he's the helper on a Wednesday. He's very pumped about being the helper. But anyway, I love him. But the original Hebrew, if you read the original Hebrew of that word, Isa Kenigdo, is not the English helper. What Isa Kenigdo means is opposite, strong partner. So what God did is he looked all over the earth and he couldn't find a opposite strong partner that could be an equal for Adam. So what does he do? He creates Eve and he puts her alongside man to subdue, to create, to multiply this brilliance that he's come up with and then to subdue the earth, to rule and reign, to lead, to have influence. Eve was a solution, the Bible tells us, to the loneliness of man. There's a completeness that we bring to the table. You know that whole like, oh, you complete me? Like it's actually a thing. <laughs> like if you're a girl and the guy says you complete me, like it's actually a thing. Tell them I said that. But what I'm really saying is someone who completes someone, who comes alongside them as an opposite strong partner, is that we were created to be their greatest allies. What is an ally? Let's go back to our war language. It's a person, group, or country that is joined with another for a particular purpose. Allies go to war together. Allies fight for one another. Allies pursue peace together. Allies establish healthy communities together. Allies trade what they have so that the other can thrive. And so for us to build again, for us to know our value so that we can then place value on the women in our world, what do we need to know and what do we need to do? We need to understand and have a revelation that we have been given authority by God to create and have dominion on the earth, to be an opposite strong partner and ally for man, and to be a God's solution in their world. 
I believe God has given women beautiful divine strategy to bring unity and completeness to every environment that you find yourself in. Unity and completeness. What would it look like to bring unity and completeness to your marriage? To bring that to your home, to bring that to your place of work, to bring that to your friendships and to bring that to your church. And so Eden and Eden, and the invitation I believe that God is, in, is giving us get to restore it here on earth reminds us that everything is about God. It's about union with God. And then it shows us the beauty of God's design when man and woman were designed to live with unified purpose. And I know some of you are sitting here right now and you're like, Tess, that's great. It's great, but it's a very old story. Very old story, it's in Genesis, and I'm not quite sure, like it's old covenant. What does Jesus have to say about all this? And so I want you to turn with me to Luke 7, if you have your Bibles. It's the last scripture, and then I'm going to close for us. A sinful woman forgiven. And then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet, and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him more. And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave more. And he said, you have rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman that he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Jesus was a revolutionary when it came to women. He wasn't just kind to them. He turned culture on its head. Some people have said of Jesus that he was a trailblazer. And he repetitively not only seeks out women, but he chooses to bring them in on the story. He chooses, them to, he chooses to use them in sermon analogies. He chooses to touch them when he shouldn't even be speaking to them or going near them. He chooses to reroute his whole tour, uh, route of going just one place so that he can go through Samaria to encounter a woman at the well so that he could share news with her that he is in fact the Messiah. Jesus sees women all throughout the New Testament. Why does he do this? Because Jesus says, I'm about my father's business. What did he know? He knew the story of the beginning because he was there. And he saw the inherent, inextricable value that the father placed on women right at the very beginning. And so he chose to come and make it right. And not only does he choose to see women, he chooses to entrust women with incredible moments within scripture. He shares that he's the Messiah with the woman at the well. There's two women who are waiting outside his tomb after his death that are the first to hear that he has indeed risen like he said he would. Why did he entrust that kind of good news to women? Why would he do that? Because when women encounter the Messiah, when we hear the good news of the gospel, that Christ died, and in his death he annihilated the power of sin and death, fulfilling the law because we could not, and he purchased for us freedom and forgiveness, restoration and redemption to the Father that we could have never done on our own. When we hear that, what is our instant response? It's like a reflex. We get up and we Minister it further. When women encounter Jesus, 
the response is ministry, and God made it that way. So what is ministry, you might ask? It's not just working for a church. Ministry is taking what you have and serving it to someone else. Taking what you've given, what you've been given, and giving it freely away. Ministry is taking what Jesus has freely given us and giving it away to all of the people that we may encounter in our days. And so when we know the truth about our value, when we truly get to know Jesus and we engage with the truth of the gospel, what he did for us, his finished work, the very thing that we cannot do on our own. When we encounter that, our instinctive response is to share it and leverage it and serve it, to give it away to the world around us. And that is how we're going to build sisterhood again. Each of us. Not just me. I'm not special. Really, I'm not. I just once was dead in my sin. And now I'm alive. And when I encounter the supernatural grace of Jesus Christ and everything he rescued me from, I cannot help but take that message that sits and burns within my heart and give it away and give it away and give it away and give it away. And And when I came to know the value that God places on his daughters, I cannot help but show up and give it away and give it away and give it away. That's ministry. And that's what all of us as, as women have been entrusted to. But it starts with all of us. Responding to Jesus himself for ourselves. Engaging who he is, the story that he has for our lives. Getting to know the value that he's placed on us as an individual. And then what tra- transcends is ministry to others. Amen? Amen. I love you to stand. I'm so grateful that you young people are here. Because from a very young age, you're going to know the value that God places on women. And you're going to carry that into your adulthood, into your marriages, into your workplaces. You're going to take that into your school. And this is why I do this. Do you know that? I do this because I believe that we're setting your generation up for something way greater than what we've stepped into today. Amen? Would you believe it for yourselves that God is speaking to you? I want to finish off this moment. It can seem a little bit left field of, because of what I've shared this morning. I mean, this evening. Oh, God, I'm so human. This evening. <laughs> but I do feel that this was just a prophetic picture that God gave me for this year in sisterhood and so I'd love you to close your eyes and 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 really I'm entrusting in this moment that God would supernaturally reveal the value of who you are in his eyes in your life a few weeks back I had a dream that I was running through sunflower fields it was so it was so vivid and so beautiful that I've become obsessed with them. And now you have to be obsessed with them too. I'm sorry. But here they are. Lucky they're amazing. And the more time I've spent reading about these flowers and enjoying their bright beauty, the more I see the significance of the dream. And I don't believe it was just for me. I believe it is for us. 
A sunflower is one of the first flowers to be grown in space. I, I, can you believe that? I think that's amazing. Where is Dylan? He's supposed to celebrate that. He's obsessed with space. <laughs> the second thing I thought that was amazing is a sunflower looks for the sun. It will do everything and anything to make sure that its face sees the light. A sunflower is not, in fact, one flower, but rather it's made up of loads and loads and loads of tiny little flowers. One sunflower, many parts. And it holds hundreds of seeds within it. But something must die, oftentimes the very flower itself, for that seed to be sown. And so I want to leave this with you this evening. You can close your eyes. Would sunflowers this evening be a reminder of your value and purpose in Him? And would you take this picture and share them with everyone in your world? Your destiny is not earth, it's space. It's heaven, a new kingdom where all of the trouble and the hardship of this life will be no more. We're moving forward, girls. We're not moving backwards. We're building again, not because we've lost ground, but because God is always moving us forward from glory to glory to glory. Would you do whatever it takes to to move your head, to turn your eyes towards the sun, because in his light you will know who you are and what you were created for. You will find your value in him. Would you keep believing that we're better together and we're building together? That we're a sum of many parts. That we get to be part of the grand story of God here on earth. That you are part of a stunning whole. And finally, Do not fear death or the death of something. For in death, the hope that we hold as the children of the living God is that there is always resurrected love. Jesus showed us this by dying. He had to die so that something new could be born, so that you and I could live in the fully restored Eden that they planned in the very beginning. Our beginning is Him. Our end is Him. And our God is the expert in putting broken things back together and raising dead things to life. Your life is a seed. And one day it will be sown into heaven so that what's left behind will be resurrected.